Dr. Grandin, what is it like for you personally to have become the most celebrated person in the field of autism? Well, I feel it's a responsibility. I get a lot of emails and letters from young kids. In fact, at the last conference I was at, I got a whole envelope of uh, letters from kids in an English class. What makes me pleased is I think I'm inspiring a lot of kids to succeed because I want to see kids succeed. Now, one problem I'm seeing with some of the fully verbal kids is they're not getting stretched enough. I see kids coming up to me at conferences where nobody's taught them how to shake hands. See, when I was a young child, I had to be party host at my mother's parties, I had to shake hands, say please and thank you, have table manners, learn how to shop. And I'm seeing too many situations where they aren't learning those basic skills. Yeah, so you, you really think they need the basic skills that every child should learn. Yes, now in the 50s, every child was taught social skills in a much more structured way. And today that's not the case. Now the so-called normal kids, they pick it up, but the autistic kids have got to be taught. Okay. And that's not being done enough. What kind of preconceptions though do you think most people have about relating to those with ASD? Autism is a really big spectrum. You're going all the way from Silicon Valley down to somebody with a lot of intellectual challenges. Now the kinds of services and things a person needs are very different, those two ends of the spectrum. And I go to different places, I go to Silicon Valley, I see a lot of people that I know are on the spectrum, and then I go see another kid that's smart at math, but nothing's being done to develop his skills and he's getting addicted to video games. And they are the same kind of kid. The thing that I'm seeing, especially on the mild end of the spectrum, is too many kids sort of becoming the label. I'm very concerned about them getting a handicap mentality. Then I go over to the meatpacking plant, and there's a whole maintenance shop of old hippies that I know are on the spectrum, and they run that maintenance shop, and they've been there for years and years and years. Why do you think the numbers, one in 68 now, have risen so dramatically? I think on the mild end of the spectrum, it's increased detection. Because I can think of kids I went to elementary school with, kids I went to college with, that today would be diagnosed on the spectrum. I think that's a big part of it on the mild end of the spectrum. Now I think there also is some severe autism that may have actually increased because there's more environmental contaminants and there's more medications uh, being given uh, during early pregnancy. Dr. Grant, and you beg parents not to let their children with autism be defined by the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Why? Well, I think the DSM made a big mistake removing Asperger's syndrome because under the DMS-4, autism you had to have speech delay Asperger was no speech delay. Now you could argue scientific reasons for taking out the speech delay stuff, but from a service provider standpoint, you know, the kind of services that somebody's nonverbal as is different than a mild kid with Asperger's. And I'm seeing too many fully verbal kids, less severe than me, getting put into a class with uh, nonverbal kids. I'm seeing too many smart kids uh, not learning job skills. That's another thing that I really push, because when I was 13, my mother had got me in a sewing job. When I was 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. Uh, it's really important that students intern in a job before they graduate from high school. They've got to learn that discipline of um, getting to work. If you could speak to every business owner in America, what would you say to convince them to hire somebody on the autism spectrum? Well, there are certain things they can do extremely well. In fact, the SAP Corporation is hiring people with autism. There's another um, project, Project Search, where they, um, there's work being done with collaborating with hospitals to train them to set up surgical in instruments for different types of surgery. And they take longer to train, but once they're trained, they're super, super good and meticulous about making sure the instruments are set up right. And that's got about a 78% uh, uh, employment rate. So you think the skills that those with ASD have to offer are often overlooked by people well, that I can, employ? Well, as I said before, I can think of kids that I went to college with that definitely were on the autism spectrum. Those individuals are all employed in good jobs. And I think a lot of this gets back to pounding those manners in, in the 50s and the 60s, and kids being on things like paper routes, where they learned work skills. Why do you think the experts in the field of ASDs focus so intensely on the deficits and not on the strengths of well, autism? Well, we need to be building up strengths. My ability in art was always encouraged. And I was encouraged to do lots of different kinds of art. If you've got a third grader that's good at math, and he can do a high school math book, let him do the high school math book. 
Don't hold them back. I want to know why you think that so little attention has been paid to the sensory processing issues. What can we learn from those? Well, I just heard about a brand new study that's been done up at the uh, in California, Dr. Wu, and they took um, children aged 4 through 12 that had speech delay, and they stayed in their regular programs, ABA or whatever the speech therapy the school was doing, and then they got an hour a day of sensory therapy where they did a lot of variety of stimulation, like walk on different kinds of flooring, smell different smells, do different activities in a mirror, big variety, always doing more than one sensory thing at a time, and it was done as a controlled experiment where half the kids just got the regular treatment and the other half got this added sensory treatment. And they got some really big significant improvements. And they made the point of using all very inexpensive things that would be in any house. There's so much division in the autism community. How do you think we can all come together and well, find a common ground? I think that merging Asperger's together with autism has made all of this worse. Because you have a segment of very, very severely handicapped kids where they're never going to be able to live independently. That's a very different kind of situation than a mild Asperger's type of kid. You see, you're, you're, you're putting too many apples and oranges together. Every other diagnosis, like dyslexia, learning problems, ADHD, you've got a fully verbal kid. Only in autism, right now, are you getting a range going from, you know, smart computer geek down to somebody that has very, very severe challenges. Now, I think the American Psychiatric Association originally figured the Asperger kids would get into this social communication category. That's not what's happening. Nobody's going into that because there's no funding for it. As the most admired person in this field, and we are literally becoming an autism nation, what do you think the most important thing is for us to be aware of? Well, there's a point where personality variants are just normal variation. I think a brain can be made more cognitive and thinking, or a brain can be made more social. Now, at what point does that become abnormal? There's no black and white dividing line. I'm getting concerned that what we're saying is abnormal is, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Obviously, a child that has severe speech delay, that's an abnormality. But when you take the kids that are just kind of socially awkward, a lot of those kids are really smart. And then you got the person that's a total social butterfly. And let's think back to the caveman days. I don't think the social yak yaks around the campfire made the first stone spear. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Grandin. Thank you for inspiring all of us as parents and children.